Hello, and welcome to Dungeons and Drama Nerds. My name is Todd Brian Backus, and I'm here today with Percy. Hello. And Nick. Hey. Today we wanted to talk about lineage after a fashion. Uh, we wanted to talk about the influence of Apocalypse World, which, since its debut in 2010, has inspired about 90 plus powered by the Apocalypse games, depending on whose metric you're using. And so first up, we want to talk about that a little bit, and then we want to talk about lineage with regards to theater um, as we trace our way through the legacy of Maria Irene Fornes. Yeah, sort of our big picture goal is looking at uh, the lineage of creative knowledge, how we make things, um, and how that knowledge gets passed down from generation to generation. Although the generations within the tabletop world are slightly shorter than the lineage of the entire theater history. Quick um, generations. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, rapid, rapid fire generations. Um, so to start, we'll talk a little bit about the lineage of Powered by the Apocalypse games, beginning with what exactly it means to be quote unquote powered by the apocalypse. So Vincent McGay Baker, I'm sorry, Vincent and McGay Baker to be formal uh, in our in our discussion, um, have defined Powered by the Apocalypse not as like a category of games, not a list of specific features that a game has, not a specific design or aesthetic, uh, but rather a, a policy about the use of intellectual property, which is very sexy and exciting and mysterious, I know. Essentially, what they say is that if you've created a game that was in some way inspired by the game Apocalypse World and you would like to publish it, as long as you mention Apocalypse World in your credits or your list of inspirations or in your special thanks, um, you, it's powered by the apocalypse. If you feel that you as a creator have been inspired by that game, you are welcome to call it powered by the apocalypse. They are in no way attempting to create some kind of aesthetic lineage or lineage of game design or they're they're not attempting to create a category. They're kind of just saying, you know, we acknowledge that we've done something new and different than what was currently happening at the time that we created the game. So if you feel like you are in some way borrowing from that or feeling inspired by that, here is a label you can put on your game to group it with other games that were inspired by Apocalypse World. But if you look at the broad swath of Powered by the Apocalypse games, you'll see that there is a lot of differentiation in genres, in mechanics, in storytelling mechanisms, in all kinds of things. But there is definitely an attitude, I guess. I don't know. I don't know exactly the word that I would use, but there's definitely, you can see some common threads that have to do with what the game is trying to do and the approach to the game design. Because that's ultimately what I would define Powered by the Apocalypse as, is an approach to game system design. It is a method. It is a vocabulary for developing games that do what you want them to do as a means of kind of unlocking your potential to create something that you want to create by giving you a framework, a, a means of attack, a, an approach. Yeah, it's not specifically about like using character books or like moves. It's about like finding ways um, to create engaging narratives. I feel like a lot of these have to do with um, shifting ideas of narrative control in the games, mm -hmm. um, which I think in many ways is one of the things that I'm really into about Apocalypse World, but is also like a pushback against the traditional um, like dungeon master as storyteller approach that Apocalypse World and its antecedents, God, I'm not going to use the word antecedents, the, the games <laughs> that the word antecedents. it seems really <laughs> We're obnoxious. We're dramaturgs. <laughs> um, We're scholars, Todd. <laughs> uh, but the Apocalypse World and the games that followed seemed very interested in this decentering of narrative control um, and in pushing away from a a storyteller who is preparing a story for somewhere between four and six people to play through, um, and instead this collaborative world building and story building um, that you see in Apocalypse World and Masks and Glitter Hearts and uh, Monster of the Week and stuff like that, um, that I think is really interesting. I'll add to that one thing that seems to link a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games is a really tight kind of story and genre focus, um, which you see in things like moves where the sort of, I think, revelation, as I understand it, of Apocalypse World was tightly focusing, you know, what do we actually want to be part of the game mechanically that defines, you know, what's what's the game about in contrast to the D20 system 
which is, you know, we have invented a, especially after third edition D&D, we've invented a system that in theory you can use in your game to resolve anything, even though that doesn't always work as well as it theoretically does. Mm -hmm. I, something that I think is cool, and I'll link this in the in the show notes, but Vincent Baker has presented, I think probably in like a Comic-Con setting, pretty extensively about how you use the Apocalypse World approach to make a game of your own in a way that is giving giving you a, a method um, as opposed to a strict like, here's what the game is, just plug in your own genre or your own style, um, but really like thinking about how you can use the mechanics to unlock a game that you actually want to, to design. Um, but he writes about how the mechanics of apocalypse world collapse inward, which is, I think really interesting. So like on the very outside, you have like the incredibly specific and, and minute mechanics that have to do with like psychic harm or, um, things like that, that are not really at all essential to gameplay, but could enhance your experience if you want to get really into the nitty gritty. Um, and then that kind of, folds in and places the conversation happening at the table between the players and the MC at the center. And that's the only thing that you absolutely need to play a game of Apocalypse World is an ongoing conversation between those two um, groups. Um, and everything else kind of builds off of that. But functionally, that's what he plays at the center. And that's what I think is really cool and interesting. And what I think I would define as like the feature of Powered by the Apocalypse games, which is essentially just like they are framed as a conversation and the mechanics are driving the momentum of that forward. Whereas at least with D20 system games, you're mediating that conversation through the mechanics in a different way. When I was talking to one of my friends who plays a lot more tabletop games than I did uh, when we started this podcast, he was talking about what he loves about Powered by the Apocalypse is that every role matters. Like there aren't misses. Uh, the way that there are in the D20 system. And I think a lot of PBTA games carry that approach as well, is that like you succeeded or you failed, but it doesn't like, but the thing is done. And so like we need to find a new way forward if that wasn't successful enough. Um, we can't just keep trying the same thing or like trying to observe the room better, hoping that we'll pick up on the clues this time. It's like, no, we move forward. We did a thing. We tried it. And these were the results. And now we move forward. Um, and that was really crucial for his enjoyment of PBTA games. Yeah, it's a sort of avoidance of the like null result, you know, even if you uh in a lot of ppta games what you'll see is unlike in say dungeons and dragons where if you attempt something and fail usually what happens immediately is nothing um you know if you swing your sword at the monster and roll a two nothing happens in ppta usually you know if you roll a two on your 2d6 then you end up in a worse situation which means that the narrative is propelled uh, in a more interesting way than just like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to sort of summarize, I think the what we're gravitating to is defining features of what it means to be powered by the apocalypse is a shift from whether or not you're able to do something to who is narrating the action um, and who has the agency to decide what happens based on on a die roll. The game is centered around a kind of ongoing conversation, even like a negotiation between the players and the MC, um, where they're collaboratively building a story and a world together from scratch completely. And then failure is framed a lot differently, where like a failure is how you progress and get better much as it is in the real world. Um, and also like there is <laughs> there is no absolute failure. There's just consequences for making mistakes um which is a thing that some people do in dungeons and dragons but i would argue it's probably not really baked into the rules the way that it is in apocalypse world yeah it's not hardwired in there yeah and i think we think of things like playbooks and we think about rolling 2d6 and adding a stat as like defining features of powered by the apocalypse games although it's funny because vince baker also writes about like i'm surprised that that hasn't fallen away more. Like I'm surprised there aren't more PBTA games that have just one character sheet that you fill out for every playbook or every character class. Like I'm surprised that these things haven't fallen away, but I also would argue that I think they're 
largely really well suited to this style of gameplay to the um system design that apocalypse world has like i think having separate playbooks is really useful because it allows everybody to be consciously bringing something different to the table to work together with like it's giving everybody very very different fuel in the collaborative world building process well and i also just like from a from a purely mechanical and like logistical space i love not needing to flip through 15 sections of a book with tailored specific to my character class stuff and instead here's like five to ten pages and it's everything i will ever need to know about that character and how they advance yeah character creation takes maybe 10 minutes as opposed to two hours <laughs> But yeah, I think this is a good place to pivot uh, to thinking a little bit more theatrically. So shifting gears entirely, um, let's 100% talk a little bit. 100% complete gear shift. Uh, yep, from, from there's no good way to map this metaphor onto a car's gear shift, um, but to shift entirely <laughs> from, from, one, from one of our worlds to the other, let's talk about Maria Irene Furness a little bit. Um, Maria Irene Furness is uh, one of those playwrights. She lived from 1930 to 2018, who is known for her incredible plays, but also, and I would honestly say perhaps especially for her influence on other playwrights um, and on the kind of Amer the development of American theater in general. Uh, I often think of her as someone who the typical uh, the typical theater goer might not be familiar with, but theater artists, especially playwrights, but theater artists in all disciplines have a deep and abiding love for her work because she was not only a prolific playwright, um, she was also a hugely influential teacher and mentor for generations of playwrights. Uh, to give the sort of Formal background, she was a Cuban-American playwright and director. Um, she also pioneered the kind of directing, playwright directing their own work practice, who was inspired by visual art and by found objects in addition to the kind of traditional literary canon. She was a founder of Intar Hispanic Playwrights in Residence Lab. Uh, she's also the recipient of eight Obie Awards and uh, created a pedagogy that allowed the playwrights she taught to follow their intuition, embrace multiple kinds of artistry, and challenge singular definitions in favor of a kind of multiplicity of languages, of cultures, of worldviews that she really promoted in her work. Uh, she's trained people all over the place, uh, notably perhaps at playwright centers in, South, in the southwestern U.S. and for a brief time uh, at the Yale School of Drama. And one of the things that is remarkable about her teaching, I think, is that you can't really identify a Fornesian student. The only thing that you can really bind them together with is uh, these interests and the sort of unique outlooks that they end up bringing to their work. Uh, some of those playwrights who studied under her include Nilo Cruz, Eduardo Machado, uh, Caridad Svich, Karen Zacharias, Elaine Romero, Luis Alfaro. Uh, I actually don't know. Do either of you know whether Paula Vogel actually studied under her or was just influenced by her? So Paula Vogel, um, they had a a relationship um, as like theater artists. Um, but Paula Vogel lists uh, Maria Irene Fornes as one of her three gods of theater, um, the other two being John Guare and Carol Churchill. But like put those three playwrights on a pedestal above all others um, as people who made very interesting art. And then Nilo Cruz, um, after studying uh, with Maria Irene Fornes at Intar, um, Fornes approached Paula Vogel and said, like, I want to give you my jewel of a student, Nilo Cruz, and introduced them and had him study um, under Paula afterwards before going on to be the first uh, Latino uh, Pulitzer Prize winner for drama. Yes. Yeah. And other students of Paula Vogel's who are sort of indirectly 
uh, descendants, quote unquote, of Furness include Sarah Rule, Chiara Alegria Hudis, Lynn Nottage, and a lot more playwrights, many of whom I would say theater goes actually have heard of because they've won things like Pulitzer Prizes, um, Tony Awards, had their plays on Broadway, et cetera, et cetera. I will also offer just a, a fact check myself in writing this list. Uh, Karen Zacharias, I think, never directly studied under Fornes, but definitely I think I think it is important to name uh, Fornes's particular influence on Latinx playwrights and sort of re- like creating that generation of artists who don't feel like they have to only write about that part of their identity, but rather let that part of themselves inform all of the work that they do. So I think... Mm. Karen Zacharias is a really good example of how you see that manifest um, and sort of that broader blossoming. Um, but I don't think they ever directly, um, I don't think she was ever directly taught by Fornes. So I just want to be clear, clear about that. Um, Thank you, Percy. <laughs> yeah. Um, to talk a little bit about her pedagogy and kind of the the things that she instilled in her students. Um, she was a, an unusual playwright Um because she she embraced a lot of kind of unusual things, especially at the time she began teaching, including uh, physical warm ups for writers, uh, practices of visualization and looking for inspiration in kind of visual art and other art forms besides theater. Uh, she used what a lot of people refer to as intuitive character creation, less grounded or less focused on the traditional Aristotelian principles that you find in things like uh, the McKee traditional film storytelling uh, paradigm and more based in just the, the artist's impulse of who do I think this person is? What is, you know, what's propelling them through the world? Uh, and also was a big advocate of accessing uh, what some people have called an interior landscape uh, that was about ecosystems of ideas of forms of uh, other artworks like we've mentioned um, so yeah a really visionary and influential teacher who has inspired tons of playwrights in in some cases, I would say wildly different uh, styles throughout the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I think what's cool about her work is that you can't necessarily pin down a style that her plays have, but they all are experimenting with the form in some way, which is, I think, a thing that you see in a lot of her artistic lineage is playwrights who aren't afraid to play with structure or, um, you know, they'll do a whole bunch of really, really short scenes or they'll weave music in. Um, one of the books that I read to research for this episode uh, talked about Chiara Alegria Hudes and uh, the way that she structures plays like Elliot a Soldier's Fugue in the style of like a musical fugue. And that's really interesting and cool. Um, and definitely like a Fornesian approach to not being afraid to play with structure and to focus on populating your world of your play with characters um, and letting everything else come from that. Yeah. I mean, I would say uh, when I was last in New York, um, I was very fortunate to get to see Fefu and her friends in the city. And it's one of the like oft read, but rarely performed and produced plays um, that many theater artists know, but very few get to see, um, particularly because the second movement is just wild in its uh, theatrical, con- in, like the breaking of theatrical constraints. Um, the The first movement, very living room drama, a number of women are introduced. Um, we get to hear backstories and banter between these characters. And then in the second movement, um, four scenes take place simultaneously. In the original production of this, this was done in a loft, I think in like Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of the four scenes were in different parts of the loft apartment. And it was like perfect for that. Um, and many people have struggled to figure out how to stage it without like breaking um, the audience apart. Uh, in the production I got to see in the city, the set was actually, instead of just being like facing the audience, the set was fully three dimensional um, in that like the audience walked through it 
for the second movement and there were rooms uh, that all of the doorways went into that we would filter through and then see an episode between some characters and then move to another and another and another before turning to our seats for the third and final movement. And so she was playing with form, uh, literally, with the form of theater and like, how do we experience a narrative and how can we overlap experiences of narrative in really cool ways. I read about where that conceit came from, which I thought was really, really charming. Um, There's a story that I read that was essentially like she was touring the space that the play was supposed to be in. And they the guy showed her like his the whoever the venue manager was that was showing them around, showed them his office and like a kitchen. And she was like, can we use these? Um, (laughs) And then did, which is so cool. Um, But yeah, the other thing that I've noticed is she's really oriented toward the visual. Like she is, has a Mm -hmm. reputation as like a director who really, um, like she's been compared to like Richard Foreman and Robert Wilson in terms of like being really exacting about the visual composition of the work that she directs. Um, and she's directed a lot of the work of the playwrights that came out of Intar as well. Um, but one of the specific exercises that she did in her playwrights workshops and when she was teaching playwrights was to have them build scenic models of their own plays, which I think is fascinating. Um, Like, I think she's really breaking down these barriers and boundaries that we've created between different artistic disciplines, um, which I think is really great um, and exciting. Yeah. It's the sort of, it's the sort of impulse that I think a lot of visionary theater practitioners have, which is away from, the kind of siloing and toward the idea of a total theater, uh, not total theater artist, because I, as I, as I recall, I think Furness did work with, you know, scenic designers and so on, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting playwrights to think beyond the page or getting scenic designers to think beyond just the built walls and, and furniture and so on and so forth. Uh, that movement toward conceptualizing theater as a whole experience. Maybe that's what I want to say. Yeah. And I think really emphasizing for the people she was teaching that like your play is coming from within you. So I think all of her exercises that she was leading and all of the teaching that she did was oriented towards giving writers the tools that they need to figure out how to say what they want to say rather than prescribing a style or prescribing a format or a structure. She was essentially, I think just saying, here's all of the keys. Um, Mm see what they unlock, which I think is really, really beautiful. Um, So you just have a generation of playwrights who are stylistically all incredibly different from each other because they're coming from the same place of like having learned from Fornes or from people influenced by her to really pay attention to your own intuition and your own interior landscape and draw inspiration from whatever you can, even if it's just like the fact that you rented a whole building instead of just the theater space. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And then now you have, I think many, many, many of the playwrights who look up to her as an inspiration or were directly taught by her are now teaching generations of playwrights in um, universities and MFA programs across the country. So you have a whole new generation of playwrights who are coming up with this influence as well, which is really exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. So now that we've talked a little bit about Powered by the Apocalypse and Fornes, um, we wanted to kind of pull some takeaways out of this. We also just want to state for the record, um, we're not implying any kind of conscious relationship between Fornes and Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, We just thought it was an interesting opportunity to look at lineage and influence um, and how uh, these two um, kind of indie darlings in different fields have had like very outsized ripples through their respective fields um, and influence. Definitely, um, as we were talking about Fornes and uh, the Bakers, is that there isn't really a specific uh, philosophy um, that drives all of these things. It's instead um, an approach uh, to storytelling in either style, um, as opposed to a you must do X, you must do Y, instead finding ways to make like interesting, meaningful narrative that's specific to you um, and brings out the very exciting interior landscapes um, that dwell within those particular 
uh, creators or collaborators for a game or a theater experience. Both Fornes and uh, the Bakers um, have this long lineage of descendants who have built and riffed on the original work that have left this indelible mark on their respective fields. Um, so, like, a game of masks is very unlike a game of apocalypse world, both in terms of style and storytelling, um, but you can still feel those um, echoes and those, like, ripples coursing through uh, a game of masks that you could in a game of Apocalypse World. And I think that's true um, for looking at something like Fefu and her friends, and then looking at something like Sarah Rule's How to uh, Transcend a Happy Marriage um, that like starts in one world and gets very weird um, and then coalesces back into that world or doesn't um, in ways that are very exciting and theatrical and like muscular even when dealing with subjects um, that we often overlook um, in terms of that, like, musculature. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to say that any one, there's like a one-size-fits-all approach to any of these things. Um, these are definitely, like, two very separate ethos is. Ethos is? Ethoi, I think. Ethoi. <laughs> oh, <I laughs> what a wonderful so word. <laughs> Um, but these are like very different uh, ethoi um, about their <laughs> respective uh, fields that lead to really incredible and fascinating works. Um, and I'm so excited that we got to play this game of Apocalypse World and also get to dive into uh, the the long-lasting effects of Maria Irene Fornes's career on the American theater. Yeah, I think there's definitely like an element of like Maria Irene Fornes had like an incredible cultural impact and like really contributed to like an incredible blossoming um, of like Latinx playwrights and Latinx culture in the American theater. And I don't know that the Bakers quite have had that degree of, of totally, influence. Totally, totally. But like, you know it's cool to think about how do we pass creative knowledge and how do we pass theater making from generation to generation and how do we pass game design from tape from generation to generation? Because I think I'm always fascinated by questions of like how we pass on creative knowledge. Um, I, I think it might actually be fair to say that they've had that influence or, or almost a comparable influence within the world of tabletop game design. I mean, you have now multiple generations of, there, there's Apocalypse World, and then there's all the games that are powered by the Apocalypse, which includes some really big players, which is a, you know, relative, <laughs> relative uh, term. But sure. still, you know, the theater is very small compared to film in terms of consumption and budgets. And so, so keeping it within that world, you know, Blades in the Dark by John Harper is a powered by the Apocalypse game. And that has its own whole kind of lineage of games that... Uh, consider themselves to be for I think the term is forged in the dark mm -hmm. games that are uh, you know pulling inspiration and sometimes mechanics and so on from that so you see you do see this chain um, yeah, and maybe I'm not being fair to the bakers well I I just also realized I was going to say earlier it's an interesting point that we didn't talk about very much um, that Fornes and the bakers are both operating in that kind of indie sphere mm -hmm. um, because I do think, you know, in a lot of artistic mediums, that becomes the place that you see the most exciting, uh, you know, innovations like you don't. OK, I may end up trashed on Twitter for this, but I'm just going to say it. I never go to a Broadway play expecting to see something that is like hugely innovative and like earth shattering even the ones that are like that have generally been nurtured elsewhere first you know that's not the function of broadway even plays like you know shows like hamilton or indecent you know mm -hmm. those were nurtured elsewhere and then brought to broadway and similarly i think you know in tabletop games Wizards of the Coast is never going to be like, 
a hotbed of cutting edge game design because that's not the role they play in the ecosystem. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know, just and I, that particular aspect of the parallel hadn't occurred to me until Todd mentioned it. Um, Broadway stands at NS Orvis. On- <laughs> <laughs> My DMs are closed. <laughs> but, but no, I think, I think you're right. Yeah, I think it's okay too. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't expect Broadway um, to wow me and to be as flexible because it's a money making machine built on like trying to appeal to as large a base as possible. And like Maria Arine Fornes, her work never appeared on Broadway um, mm-hmm. during her life. It might someday in the future. I don't expect a commercial producer is going to do that i think you're going to see that much more in a downtown space which was her bread and butter um but allowed her to do really interesting and flexible things that i also think the bakers um are able to do like more interesting and flexible and like what if we do a weird one page rpg and what does that mean um Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me, too, because like pulling that parallel out a little bit further, um, if Fornes is most popular among people who do theater for a living, like if she her if she is best known among this kind of theater circle, I think the same goes for Powered by the Apocalypse, because I think you don't see a ton of pop like in the popular tabletop sphere. Everyone's talking about Dungeons and Dragons and maybe Pathfinder if they're particularly spicy. Um, <laughs> like you see discourse or you see conversations about powered by the apocalypse games among professional Twitch streamers and people who do tabletop games for a living or who write tabletop content for a living. Like these are the people who are invested in systems that challenge the dominant narrative and the dominant model for these games. Um, and I was going to say this is a great case for like funding indie ventures in all in all spheres. Although I guess if you like pour a bunch of money into them, they become what they're trying not to be. Or maybe I'm just a pessimist. <laughs> but I also um, there's one other thing that I want to talk about with regards to um, Fornes's legacy in the House of Paula Vogel. Her theater, her influences on Nilo Cruz, Pierre El Grijudes and Lynn Nottage by Lee Jones. Um that's dissertation. We'll put it in the notes. Um, <laughs> Jones talks about how Vogel, when she was starting out, um, didn't feel like she had a lot of icons to look up to, um, particularly female playwrights. And we can see just in the space of her career um, how much the playwrights that Maria Irene Fornes influenced and the playwrights that Paula Vogel has shepherded, how like wildly different that is. Like, I think most of the working playwrights that I know today whose careers I'm like very excited about are almost exclusively women. Whether that's a Sarah Rule, a Chiara Alegria Hudez, a Lynn Nottage, um, a Katori Hall, like all of these incredible like trailblazers that just 30 years ago, we didn't have a space for those women at all. And like, I think that's such a cool thing um, for this, like for this work to be happening. Um, yeah, and that I, makes me very excited about like well, and theater. We're, and we're seeing a centering of women in the plays themselves. Like Fefu and her friends was, I think, revolutionary because like, you don't see a man in that play ever. Um, they're outside. And I think like and her work generally, I think, is is super feminist in its intention and it is super all about centering women and their experiences um and being really honest about what that experience is and i think we are seeing more of that on our stages as well um maybe not explicitly because but certainly helped by um this immense legacy and this approach to playwriting that allows you to let your experiences and your identity filter into your work in a really authentic and almost subconscious way or just you know that that lets you do what you want and need to with it as opposed to feeling obligated to like write plays about women yeah no and we'll talk about this a little bit but i i think a similar thing has gone on with pbta games too where We'll get we'll get into this more uh, in a couple of weeks 
but the Powered by the Apocalypse game space and fan space has kind of ended up being, I think, a very uh, progressive space and certainly a space that likes to think of itself as progressive. I think the actual record is a little more Mm -hmm. nuanced than that, but that's true. That's also certainly true of you know almost everything as well yeah like like anything um but but it is it has really been a uh a place for it seems to me looking in from the outside as particularly a place where um queer tabletop role players have carved out a space for themselves players and like game designers and storytellers it is a very gay group of people but i mean it's also (laughs) it doesn't surprise me that that sphere leans progressive if only because like it's a it's a game approach or like a game aesthetic that's about listening to each other and having empathy for each other like naturally it will attract people who value those things and are good at those things um who i think tend to skew well and i think it's also a rebellion from the like heteronormative hegemony 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 of uh wizards of the coast yeah yeah like it is a clear like there are not a lot of queer stories in D um that are in the games already and so there's a lot of queer artists who have set out to say fuck that we're gonna be queer all the time mm-hmm. yeah hot gay bro dragons hot gay i don't think bro that's dragons. actually empowered by the apocalypse game so we should <laughs> cut that reference <laughs> and there's also thirsty sword lesbians <laughs> on kickstarter now they, they didn't pay now. us to say that. <laughs> no, I'm just really excited because I will play literally anything with the word lesbians in it. Because um, <laughs> I'm that kind of gay. Just wanted to pop a little note in here that at the time that this episode is being released, the Thirsty Sword Lesbians Kickstarter that we mentioned in this episode is currently fully funded and you can buy it in the future if you didn't get a chance to back it while the Kickstarter was active. Dungeons and Drama Nerds is produced by Todd Brian Backus, Percy Hornack, and Nick Orvis, and is mixed and edited by Anthony Sertel Dean. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at DN Drama Nerds. Check out cast bios on our website, dungeonsanddramanerds.com, and tune in next week for another episode of Dungeons and Drama Nerds. 